song says my God is good my God is good oh my God is good oh my God is good oh my God is good oh
to him in your own words. Lift up your hands and say, Father, we thank you because you're the most high. Come on, let that new song begin to move out of you. Come on, speak to him. Pray to him. Pray to him. Say something out of your mouth. Let your mouth move. Come on. Pray, 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 pray. Open up your mouth and speak to him. Father, we bless you. For you are so worthy, God of heaven. For you are Yahweh. You are the Alpha. You are the Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end, my God. You know all the situation, God. You know everything going on in people's lives, my God. You know it all, God. For you who knows the foundations of the earth. For you who sees the top of the world, oh God. You are Lord, we come to worship and trust God. For you are the Alpha and Omega. That's why we worship you. You are the God. We bless you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. So you are fine.
Yahweh, you are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We glorify you. We give you all the honor. You alone are God. There is no one like you, Jesus. You are the beginning and the end, Lord. You are the Alpha and the Omega, Father. We give you glory for who you are, our God. You are the breath of our life, King of glory. You are the source of our salvation, King of glory. You are the fortress of our refuge, O King of glory, Father. We honor you, we glorify you, we praise you, O Lord our God. You deserve all the praises, you deserve all the worship, you deserve all the honor. You are the center of our worship, O King of glory, Father. We come before you this morning, Father, to worship you. We come to say thank you, King of glory. We come to glorify you, Father. We come to bow down before your King of glory, Father, to honor you. To say thank you, King of glory, for saving us. To 
say thank you for sustaining us, O oh Lord, King of glory. To say thank you for protecting us, O oh King of glory, Father. You are worthy, O oh God. You are worthy, O oh God, King of glory. There is no one like you, Jesus. Father, we want to thank you, King of glory, for the, for the protection. We want to thank you for each and every one of us, King of glory, that you've, you've enabled the King of glory to come before you, O oh Lord, for your presence. Father, your people have come to worship you. They have come, King of glory, from different homes, Lord, from different places, Father. But they have been able, Father, to, to make it here, Lord, not because of anything. Not because they are so strong. Not because of their mighty. But because of your grace, Lord, King of glory. It's your grace that has always brought, brought, drawn us to yourself, O King of glory, Father. Father, we want to see you glorified in our midst even today. In our midst, there are people who are sick, Lord, King of glory. There are those who are weak in different ways, our Father. But we pray, Father, as we join together, help us to not focus on our weaknesses, O Lord. May our weakness, Father, become the source, become the energy to worship you, Lord King of glory. Because there is nowhere we can run to apart from you alone. We come to you, O Lord King of glory. Father, we pray that we see you glorified in our midst. As the word is going to pre be preached to us, Lord. Help us to hear you speak to us, O oh Lord. May you change our hearts, King of glory. May you heal our, 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 our diseases, our spiritual diseases, Lord, King of glory. And our physical diseases, Lord, King of glory. May we hear you speak to us, O oh Father. May you change us by your word. May you rebuke us, O oh King of glory. May you correct us, O oh Father, we pray. And lead us, Father, to walk in righteousness, Lord, because of your word. And we pray, Father, for the sick who are in their homes. We pray for the sick who are in the hospitals, especially those of the house of faith, Lord, my God, King of glory. May you, Father, stretch forth your hand of healing, O Lord. And touch their physical bodies, O King of glory, Father. And touch their spirits, O Lord, King of glory. And be with them, our Father. Speak to them, Father, King of glory. Quietly, Lord, King of glory. Let them hear the sweet voice of you, Lord, encouraging your people. We want to thank you for the leadership of this church, Father. May you continue, Father, to strengthen the leadership of the church. May you continue to strengthen us, O oh, Father, to worship, to serve you, Lord King of glory. May you continue to grow this church, this church congregation, Father. We thank you for the choir, King of glory, and for the entire team, Father. May you continue to strengthen this whole team. That we may see you glorified whenever we come before you, Lord. Even in our lonely lives, Father, King of glory. Even in our secret places, O oh, Father, that we may see you glorified. That we may hear you speak to us, O oh, Father. Draw us near unto yourself, O oh, Lord, King of glory. Give us the thirst, Lord, and the desire to seek your face and to yearn for you. We thank you. Father, in our midst, there are people who have lost their jobs. There are people who have jobs, but they are no longer earning as they used to earn. We pray that you intervene, Lord King of glory. You hold in your hands the economy of this world, Father. You promised a blessing upon the work of the hands of your people. And you are the God who keeps your promises. May you help your people, King of glory. We thank you. We glorify you. Because you are God. You are Yahweh. You are Yahweh. Thank you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. This time, as we take our seats, we want to welcome the preacher to bring God's word to us. morning. I hope we are well this morning. It's again a great privilege for me to bring God's word. And I want us to turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter No, 41, sorry, 41. 
Isaiah 41. It is a series we started during the lockdown. And I know some of you have been following this. But those of you who are finding us in the middle, it's okay. Uh, we can catch up. This is God's word. It is new every morning. But again, I'm very thankful uh, for the first time, you know, almost like six months without preaching to this congregation live. We've been doing it electronically. But you know, we thank God for that. But again, it's also my encouragement to you that uh, be careful. Uh, take enough uh, vitamin C. Drink some lemon and passion fruit, please, so that we may suppress this uh, virus that is becoming a world pandemic. Amen? Yeah, do your best. Let me read from verse 1 to 20 as you follow in your translations. Listen to me in silence, all coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east? Whom victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him, so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely. By path, his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smoothes with the hammer, him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not. You warm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. The tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord, in the Holy One of Israel. You shall glory. When the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together, that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the time you've given us here to hear your word. Praise you to worship you, Lord Father. And as we come this morning before you to feed from your table, to 
feed from your mouth, to feed from your breath. Father, may you breathe on us a new breath, a breath of life, a breath of your word, that we may be renewed and be comforted, oh God, in a world that is filled with trouble and danger every place we go, oh God. Father, we thank you, we believe you, and we trust you as you use me, a weak person standing before your own people, your own sheep. May they be fed, oh God, Father, for the glory of your name. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is again a message of comfort. Isaiah chapter 40 up to 66 is a message of comfort. And that is book two of Isaiah. And we are in that particular section. And I'll be selecting a few texts for this particular purpose. And this morning... It's a message of comfort, and the message is fear not. Simple. We can even live and go with that. Fear not. The Lord says, fear not. And I have two points, although I have some other subsections. Point number one is basically a charge against false worship. And then point number two is an encouragement from God, and we'll be seeing at least three encouragements under that. What we see here is that God enters into a controversy with those who had fallen into false worship. In fact, he starts verse 1 by saying, listen to me in silence like listen some of us we know that when we are growing up if your parents said listen what would you do you just keep quiet no nonsense you know if you don't listen something might happen to you right listen in silence so God is bringing a charge against his people a charge against false worship the Israelites had gone back into false worship rather than worshiping God, the true God. This Friday we had our prayer meeting here, and I remember one of uh, the mothers here in the church said, you know, people have really backslid somehow, even in lockdown, in this lockdown season. And she was saying, you tell people, let us go to church, and they say, well, we've been worshiping God even watching messages on television. Why, why should we go back? Can you imagine? Those are the people we are living with. People tend to backslide. So God says, keep silent all islands and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to Judgment. God is calling his people to judgment. First of all, keep silent, then come, and I want you to speak. By the way, how much can you speak before God if he takes you into judgment? Of course, we have some people in the Old Testament who tried that. God summoned them, but they could not say anything. This is a call to reason with God. In the same book, God calls his people to reason together with him. You know, in the first chapters. So Isaiah 41 here from verse 2 to 3, he says, who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every stop? He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings under foot. You are going to see this who, even in verse 4. Who has performed this? Who, who, who? Because the people are complaining. By the way, this message, Isaiah brings this message, but this message was almost 70 years in the future, isn't it? It was a future message. It was a future prophecy of what was going to happen to the children of Israel in, in, in exile. He says, who, who is it that raised up this man from the east? Those of you who know the Bible very well, the man from the east is the chosen king God was going to use, okay, in a special way, 
to rebuild the walls of Israel, and that is Cyrus. He's like, who raised him? He was a foreign king. Who raised him? Last week, last Sunday, we heard from our brother Justus that God is in every affair, whether it is trouble, whether it is sin, God is there. So he's asking them, who raised up this man from the east? Long before Cyrus was born, God thus spoke of him. It is declared that the work he should do was God's work. It was God who was sending him. What better proof could there be that God is God? He's saying, do false gods ever told you what is in the future? You are turning these false gods. Do the false gods ever created you? Do they provide for you in a sense? Now you are turning away from the true God. Do those false gods do anything good for you? This is what God is charging the children of Israel. He's also charging us. Because many times when we fear, what happens? When we fear, we resort to other means rather than God. I also do that. When I fear, I try to find my own way out of fear rather than running to God. The children of Israel were going to be taken in exile, and even when they were in exile, they could turn to other gods instead of turning to the true God of Israel. Then he says, who did all this? Who? Who performed and done this? Calling the generations from the beginning. Verse 4, he says, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. Do we hear the people speaking here? It is only God who is speaking, isn't it? It is God who is speaking. When God charges you, you better keep quiet, isn't it? Because you have nothing to speak back when you have fallen away from him. He goes on again to say, I, Jehovah, the first and with the last, I am he. Only God has the ability to tell the future from the beginning. Some of you are going to tell me, ah, there are some spiritists, there are some fortune tellers. All right, there are some fortune tellers. And sometimes they can guess. And then you uphold him in a special, you uphold them in a special way, right? But these are not God. They are just small gods. God sees things as they are. He looks at a tree, and what does he see in a tree? is like a carpenter. When he sees a tree, he sees furniture. When he sees an orange seed, he sees baskets of oranges. That is God. For you see a seed. God is the creator. God is in control. We ought to turn back to him. When fear hits us, we should never turn to other gods. We ought to remain focusing on this God. This is a church. I'm still on the church. Verse 5 and 6, the church goes on. The coastlands have seen and they are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong, but be strong in what? Listen, see what they do. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and who smooths with the hammer, he who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it, can be, it cannot be moved. What's the message here? Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his neighbor, be strong. You know, God has left us. We can make up our own gods. You remember in the Old Testament? When Moses had stayed too long on the mountain, what did the people tell Aaron? They told Aaron, let us make a calf. And they made a calf. And they used the calf to worship. I mean, they worshipped a calf in place of God. In the same way, when fear comes, people get united and they form up their own small gods. Everyone helps his neighbor. And how do they help their neighbors? The craftsman strengthen the goldsmith. They say, you know, let us make up an image for ourselves. They get some timber, then they make up an image. Eh? 
Bikira Maria. Right? They make up an image or they make up an image from clay. They fasten it. Then they move around with it. This is our God. Right? This is our God. They move around with it. Have you seen this in Uganda? Yeah. Even the police can lead, you know? Hmm? A convocation for over miles and miles carrying a stature which doesn't it doesn't move by the way they fasten it they make it up everybody helps his neighbor says let us be strong let us make a god for ourselves may god help us not to do that when i was reading let me give you a quote it says when men fight against god they get united have you ever seen that wherever people fight god they all get united Remember when Jesus was being crucified, the Jews, the Romans, and everybody, the Gentiles, they all got united. But before the crucifixion, they were divided. They were divided. But evil men come together. They unite together to do evil. All evil against God, and they love to do that. So he goes on to say, what a very sad thing it is that God's children should ever fall out. There's one sin that I never had charged upon, upon the devils, namely the sin of disunity. Devils are never disunited. It's Christians who are disunited. You know that? Devils work together. Evil men will work together. Corrupt people will work together. Mafias work together, right? That's what they do. Of all the evil things we have heard, I've never heard that among the principalities of the pit, there has never, ever been any division into sects and parties. Oh, sad that in this present respect we should fall short of that. When man, when man fears, he sets up gods to help him, to appeal to. And again, the Bible tells us we should not make any graven image in the form of God and we should not even worship him. May we have no symbol, no visible object of worship, whatever, but get rid of that and before the great and invisible spirit. So that is the church. I could go on and on, but I just wanted to summarize it. Just a church against false worship. What is false worship? False worship is turning away from paying allegiance to the true creator God, and then we make up gods of our own. And some of you are going to say, I don't have any images. Of course you do. They might be in your heart. They may not be physical, but you may have an image in your heart, something you treasure so much, right? It might be your wife or your husband, your children or your car or your house or what, whatever. It may be in your own heart. You have a sin that you are treasuring. You don't want to get rid of it. And nobody sees. And nobody knows about it. It's your own. Your own. So after charging them. And they are quiet. What does God do? He gives an encouragement. From verse 8. From verse 8 we get an encouragement. 8 to 20. And I'm going to split this into three parts. First of all, we have God's covenant love. God reminds Israel, and he also reminds us as a church. In verse 9, he says, but you Israel, by the way, when he speaks of Israel, he's also speaking of the true Israel. And who is the true Israel? The true Israel is the church. You are the true Israel. My servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. You are my elect. You are in my hands. You know what God is saying? If he saved you, he's saying you are in my hands. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says we are in his own hands. And he's also in the hands of the Father. And none, none, and no one can snatch us out of his hands. Hallelujah. None. He says, you are my chosen one. 
That is a wonderful message. Because the children of Israel had played a harrot into idolatry. They gave themselves to other gods instead of the true God of Israel. And God is saying, you are my friend. There's friendship here. You are my servant, but you are my friend. We all love friends. Happy are they who have a father who is a friend of God. Do you know what that means? When you are a friend of God, it means blessings can flow from you and to your children and your children is children. Amen? And who makes us into a friend of God? Jesus Christ. He said that in John chapter 15, is it 15 verse 15? He said, I no longer call you servants, but now you are friends. So what does God do? Sometimes we think he doesn't strengthen us. God gives strength. And when he gives strength, he silences fear and encourages faith. Because the children of Israel were fearful. Where there is fear, we need to replace it with faith. Isaiah 41 verse 10. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Why do you fear when you know I am with you? This is what God is saying by implication. You have no need to be threatened by the evil one. No Satan, no the demons. He says, do not be dismayed for I am your God. I am your sufficiency. I am all that you need. I am your friend. I change not. If I say I'm your friend, I am your friend. We even have a saying, friends are friends forever. Isn't it? There's also a song I used to love. Friends are friends forever. Right? Anybody who knows that song? Right? Friends are friends forever. You may be unfaithful, but God is not. His friendship is everlasting. He's immutable. He never changes. And because he's God, the strong one, he promises, I will strengthen you. Don't fear. This is a message of comfort. And I want to comfort you from God's word. He says, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. His hand is strong enough to uphold us. We have weak hands, and we use the weak hands to make up God's. But you have a strong hand of God to uphold us. Not only do we get strength, and he also brings to nothing those that are incensed, those who are angry at us, those who are enraged, those who are infuriated against us. Those who strive against you. And that is another submission I'm bringing to you. He says, God will fight your enemies from verse 12 to 14. He does so from verse 12. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who are against you shall be as nothing at all. And sometimes we want them to simply seize right away. No, they will not go right away. You have to wait. Hallelujah. Because God is what says so. We need to trust him. This is the point here in verse 12 to verse 14. Those who struggle with you, God will bring them to nothing. Christian, walk with God. Keep on advancing. Not be diverted. Stand your ground. Resist the devil, as James says, and the devil will free. He doesn't say keep on you not chasing him. I hear people all the time chasing the devil. I chase you. Go out. Go, 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 go. Go in the name of Jesus. I chase you. No. For you as a Christian, the Bible tells you, eh? resist. You know what it means to resist? It's like Museveni, National Resistance Army, right? Resist. Stand your ground. Our president, right? Stand your ground. You can tell he's a very resistant man, right? Resist the what? The devil. You stand your ground. And when you stand your ground in the Lord, what happens? Hallelujah. The devil flees. You don't need all the time to say, I chase you. Go in the lake of fire. Here, people, you know. Go in the lake of fire. Where you, you suffer forever. Yeah, he's going to be there forever, by the way. God's judgment is going to come. Your work as a Christian is to stand your ground. Resist. And then he does what? He frees. 
Sometimes he comes back to check on you. Resist. Amen? Resist. This is what God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 12, verse 3. He said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. So don't be worried. When people bless you, those are going to be blessed. Whoever curses you, what happens? God curses. I don't need to curse him. I leave him to God. God will deal with him. Amen. He says, this I who says to you, fear not, verse 13. I am the one who helps you. God is our helper. Our helper. I am God who redeems you. God is our redeemer. He delivers you. He knows we are in hot soup. He knows we are in trouble. So he comes to redeem us. He talks about Jacob. He talks about you in the same way. He says you are like a worm. Do you know the vulnerability of a worm? Where do worms stay? And sitting and where do they stay? They stay underground, isn't it? They stay in the earth. Once they are exposed to the sun, they die. You and I are worms. If a worm can hide in the earth, where should we hide? Let us hide in God. God. And once you hide in God, you are protected. This is a message of comfort. You don't need other gods. You are protected by God. You may not see what's going on, but God protects you. Last week I was reading on Facebook, one of our brothers, he used to come to church here, Matandika, in Malawi, and he got into an accident with his wife in Malawi, and the vehicle overturned. And he came out with his wife. Right? With no scratches. Right? The vehicle overturned. And he came out walking with his wife. Hallelujah. And I wrote him, I said, the angels always around us. Before your time comes, God will protect you. Because you are his and he knows the best for you. The only time it can be protected, as I told you, is to hide itself. But God says, hide in me. God knows how to, he knows how we vacillate, how we turn back and forth in our faith. So he knows that. He knows how weak we are. And that's why he comes every time, you know, to encourage us. Those of you who are parents, you know this. How your children, you know, turn back and forth, right? And you are patient with them, don't you? You are patient with them, isn't it? Who is not patient with his children here? Uh -huh. Although some, some children need extra grace. Uh -huh. Extra grace. But again, that is grace. You are patient. If you are patient with your children, what about God? God is patient with us. How many times the Lord puts it, I will help you, I will help you, I will help you. This is over and over and over in the Bible. But then also lastly, God is not deficient in resources. He's not. He's not. He's telling us from verse 15, when you go back, you read. He says, truly, when the mountains are beaten into chaff and blown away into the winnowing fan, there is room for rejoicing and magnifying God. It's like... The deeper our sorrows, the higher our jubilation. Don't think you are going to get victories without the cross. The more you suffer as a Christian, the more you will jubilate, right? It's the same measure when God helps us. And when the poor are needed in verse 17, when they seek water, when there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. What a blessed promise. In times of need, in times of thirst, in times of hunger, God does not run out of resources. He's not deficient with, in resources. He has it all. Amen. He has fed you during this pandemic. How many of us have not been eating? By the way, you really ate. There are some people who have grown even fat during COVID. Fatter than they were. God has been faithful to us. 
He feeds us. He cares for us. See what God can do here, even in verse 19. I will put in the wilderness the cedars, the acacia, the olive. I will set the desert into the cypress, the plain, and the pine tree. In verse 18, I will open rivers in the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. That is only God who can do that. Only God. He does not, he's not deficient in resources. Let me end by giving an excerpt that I read about Martin Luther. Those of you who know Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a reformer. And he was a very cheerful man as a rule. But he also had a terrible depression. Don't think that people who are cheerful never get depressed, by the way. Don't be mistaken. When you see people, ever, you know, jolly, 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 right now, they also get depressed. Martin Luther was also a man full of depression. Yet God used him. He was at one time so depressed that his friends recommended him to go away for a change of air to see if he could get relief. He went away, but he came home as, a miserable, as miserable as ever. He thought he would be okay. But coming back, he was as miserable as ever. So when he came home, he went into the sitting room. His wife, his wife's wife, Kat, right? Catherine Von Bola was sitting there, and she was dressed in black, and all the children were blessed in black. And then Martin Luther asked, who died? Who died? I didn't know who died. And she said, doctor, have not you heard that God is dead? God is dead, my husband, Martin Luther. Would never be in such a state of mind if he had a living God to trust him. Did you get it? Did you get that? Did you get the point here? Martin Luther was depressed. So this wise wife dressed in black and all the children. And then Martin Luther had to ask, who died? And then the wife said, my husband, I've never seen you like this. It seems God is already dead. That's why we dressed like this. Then he burst into a heavy laughter and he said, Kate, you are a wise woman. I've been acting as if God were dead and I will do so no more. Go and take off their own black. If God be alive, why are we discouraged? If we have a God to look to, why are we cast down? Amen? Why? That's the point. Fear not. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. You are my friends. May we so faithfully serve him that it might be fitting for the Lord to speak of us in all three of these items. I'll give you strength. I'll provide my strength, but I can also use my strength against your enemies. Be courageous, church. Be courageous. God is not dead. He is alive. Amen? He is alive. And you cannot be alive in God without Jesus Christ. If you are now out of Christ, let me tell you, you need to come to Jesus. It is only Jesus who reveals the Father to us. Come to Christ this morning. And if you are in Christ, stop acting as if God is dead. Our God is a living God. So let us rejoice and be glad in this day and now and forever. Amen. Before taking too much more time, we want to come to the Lord's Supper this morning. I haven't celebrated the Lord's Supper since March could even remember the first week of March. Can you imagine? I've been yearning. We wanted to try to do it okay, online. We could not do it. Okay? We could not do it. 
But today, we need to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a reminder for the grace of God that has given to us in Christ Jesus. And I want to welcome you to this supper this morning. If you are a Christian, walking in the fear of the Lord, right? Growing in faith, bearing the fruit of righteousness, this supper is for you. It is for those who are in Christ, who have recognized their sin and they need a savior, Jesus Christ. And today is going to be a little bit different because of the uh, these so-called the soaps, right? The soaps. So we have three tables. Okay? We'll be praying here and I'm going to ask three of the brothers, one will stand over there, one over there, and one here and we pray. You go there, you pick right the bread and you pick the cup right so the people here will go that way and the people over there will go that way and the people around here will come in front here amen and then we can celebrate the supper together hallelujah let me call the brother to go to the tables and then we pray <clears throat> this is bread and this is wine products of nature and none of these turn into the real body of Jesus Christ, but they are symbolically blessed and consecrated for holy use. For the purposes of reminding us of the grace of God that we may grow on and on. We grow in Christ. And our growth is prescribed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So I want to welcome you this morning. And if you are standing in a right uh, state with Christ, this supper is for you. But if you are under discipline, please, when don't come up front here. Oh, don't come, don't go to those tables. My hands are going to remain clean. I've told you, I've warned you. There are some consequences to this. Not just a mere ordinary meal. You have your meal when you go home. Amen. Let us pray. In the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come and worship you. And Father, we also want to thank you for this supper, a constant reminder, a perpetual celebration that we have to do until we get in heaven and that heavenly banquet that you usher us into your kingdom. We pray that you bless it, bless these elements for holy use, for holy purposes, that your name may be honored and glorified in our lives. Father, we thank you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please move. We ask you to move and then pick. Those of you who are outside and you came in the first service, you can please come in and no, they are for the second service, okay.
after prayer he broke it and gave to his disciples and said take it this is my body which is broken for you let us do supper was over he took the cup and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood drink all of you from it as you celebrate my death until I return let us drink and let me ask you to stand up as again the same way we give our tithe and offering as we join the choir sing together.
have a name that is beautiful, that is powerful, that is wonderful, so magnificent, beyond all human words. We cannot explain your name, the name by which we are saved name by which we are healed, the name through which we have our encouragement. You are the Lord our God, Jehovah our keeper, Jehovah our provider. You are Jehovah our banner. You are Jehovah our victory. You are Jehovah our refuge. How beautiful your name is, Lord. We thank you for the word you've given us, Lord. We thank you for speaking to us and for reminding us that our hope, our comfort, our refuge is in you. And Father, we thank you for rebuking us for all our unbelief, for all our doubt. Lord, many times we wander away from you. We wander from faith and we let fear lead us into mistrust in you. But Lord, now that you've spoken, we pray by the name of Jesus, your son, that you would be pleased to encourage us, to revive us, to trust you. We give you praise for your word. We give you praise for your Holy Spirit. And we praise you for the sweet fellowship we have with you and for the opportunity you've given us to come and worship you. Bless your people this day and for the rest of the week, Lord. May we see you as Lord and as King and as everything in all that we do. In the praise of your name, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may his mercy continue to lead you. May you walk in faith and trust, knowing that there is no other God but Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nis, Jehovah Sabbath. Jehovah, our everything. He is the Alpha and He is the Omega, the beginning and the end. Besides Him, there's no other God. Trust in Him. He will help. He will save. May the week be blessed for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.